This is something I was actually going to think about discussing because if we start do if we do start going over to foundation of the electrodes, our thought currents might significantly go upwards. It will do, and so we may it have to in, incorporate some level of. Which was one of the things that London that. London Underground had. That's why they had the rule of sixteen. One of the reasons why they had the rule of sixteen ka because they did find over ten. All right, well, let's hold that for when we're in the actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chat. All right, shall we go? <coughs> Sorry, John, we're being very unprofessional. <laughs> Dave's just appeared out of nowhere. And five. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another E5 podcast. I am your host, Paul Meenan, and I'm welcoming back my regular tag team partners. Introduce yourself. Hello, I'm JW. And I'm joining you this evening. It's David Sparky Ninja here. So, Dave, you were listening in um, when we were talking about earthing mm-hmm. the other day. And we we, we kind of realised after we finished, which is always the way, um, that there's so much more to this subject. So we're going to talk about it. it may take five minutes, may take half an hour, may take an hour. Who knows? Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about earthing, um, earthing of electrical installations. Um, for those of you who may not have uh, Listen to the last one. Uh, Earthing as defined under 7671 is the connection of exposed conductive parts of an installation to the main earthing terminal of that installation. And that main earthing terminal is connected by an earthing conductor, which is a protective conductor connecting the main earthing terminal of an installation to an earth electrode or to other means of earthing. No mention of bonding uh, because bonding isn't supposed to be a form of earthing. It is a way of equalizing equipotential voltages or equal voltages as us humans call so, it. Before before you dive in then, I mean, Sorry. I mean I've listened obviously to the previous and you guys went into a good amount of depth. Um, but I'm gonna ask the more stupid question is do we think that earthing and bonding should be a single phrase like it is? Like it is in this book, Giants Notes A. Is earthing and bonding something we should keep in common mind? Or do you think we should start to seriously take them separate? Well, they are separate. Ooh, good question. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people get these confused. But we call it earth bonding, don't we? Sometimes. Yeah. Because well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's a really bad phrase. It should go away, <laughs> really. But uh, yeah, I mean, they are totally separate things, and they're done for two totally separate reasons. And yeah, yeah, quite right. On the front of the cover, it says earthing and bonding, as it's all in the same uh, particular guidance note eight there. So yeah, maybe they should be. Uh, separated away like that i think there should definitely be some kind of distance put between the two because we have a habit of applying them as a combined function or a combined principle that's my observation well you've just dived straight head into the deep territory and swamp so let's let's just so we've just defined what earthing is obviously it's the connection of a fixed electrical installation into the general mass of earth for the purposes of safety but Mm -hmm. bonding conductors is a protective conductor providing equal voltage bonding. I hate the word equipotential. Equipotential is a nice old fashioned word, but equipotential means equal voltage equal bonding. Voltage. Yeah. And there are plenty of diagrams that you can Google and you can find in documents that show a man holding a kettle or touching a radiator and there's an extraneous pipe. And if there's a fault in that metal kettle or whatever a piece of equipment, it then earths itself down through the CPC into the consumer unit, then will liven up all circuit protective conductors and bonding conductors at the same time, making sure that every exposed protective conductor is at an equal voltage and hence protecting that person from shock, creating an equipotential zone. That's the principle of it. Do I think earthing and bonding should be segregated? Um, I'm going to say no. However, I think our industry needs to realise there is a thought process when it comes to earthing and I think the thought process is what is the earthing characteristics and the rules of earthing Mm -hmm. what is the um the general principles of what I need as far as protection of the installation regards to earthing and then how I configure my earthing for maintenance disconnection etc and any other earthing systems and I think bonding needs to be considered in line with whatever the earthing characteristics are but there are two separate thought processes that need to occur and that's Mm -hmm. probably something where i could tell you now and john 
hopefully you'll agree with me the amount of people you go into a wholesaler and they'll go yeah um, i've just got to sort of bonding out in this house and you're like oh right is there no bonding no no i've just got um i've just got to finish wiring the circuit and, you know too many people think the circuit cpc is the bonding conductor it can be but then you're going to have 10 or 16 mil cpcs uh, because you can use the circuit protective conductor as a bonding conductor but it must be sized in accordance with a bonding conductor and I, I, I was at an NIC live a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to lie. Uh, there was a chap there who stood up and did not know the difference between earthing and bonding. And he was a full scope approved contractor. Um, it was embarrassing. Um, I, saw, I saw the same at an Alex where Napit had to spend about 20 minutes trying to illustrate the differences between them. Yeah. You know, these are fundamental principles. Um, regulation 13216, no alterations and additions. The last part of it is the uh, thing and bonding arrangements are adequate for the circumstances. Mm -hmm. If you do not have, if you make an alteration to an electrical installation, then there is no means of earthing. You have to then take that in consideration. Now, it may be, as Mr. Ward very um, cleverly states, you could class two if you don't have a lighting circuit with a CPC. You could class two it. There's, there's means and ways of selecting the and erecting the installation so it's safer the level mm -hmm. of safety is is not impaired and it, it, it will still protect the end user um who is not a skilled or instructed person um but yeah i think a lot more needs to and i know why they made this earthing and bonding. please know i've got the latest blue one um i know why they made um this an earthing and bonding book but i think what it should start off with i think it's terribly formatted to start yeah. with because the first 20 pages should be explaining exactly what earthing is um, and I think it just needs to clarify that earthing is paramount for any bonding measures that you take. And I don't I don't think that's clear enough, but we'll we'll cover we'll cover that quite a bit. Now, in in the last podcast, we defined a TNS, um, what a TNS was. And we showed it on the screen. Uh, terra neutral, separate earth neutral, separate throughout the supply cable, um, which is good. It's good old fashioned system. And then in 1978, they introduced something called TNCS, which is where the uh, the line conductor or the live conductor is in the cable, and then the surrounding armoring uh, is a combined neutral and earth, so they're effectively the same conductor, and they just split off at the uh, origin or intake position. Um, a TT, Terra Terra, which is you provide your own earthing system via rods or a, a multiple of rods. We kind of touched on IT a little bit because it's very rare none of us have worked on it and we also talked about the dreaded tnc which you're not allowed to connect into any public supply network which is basically where the earth and neutral are combined but <clears throat> yeah because you mean where they do do it yeah you, you can't put tnc um you can't protect it with rcds can you tnc so tnc no. is redundant well john yeah i mean tnc offers it's not allowed and so don't go using it but it offers there's no protection it's basically in your installation you've only got two conductors line and the combined neutral and earth and apparently there were some places in uh, certain parts of eastern europe used to put three pin sockets in and the two wires come in so line and then the combined one and then to link to the earth it was just a little link in the back of the socket between the neutral and earth pins and that works fine as long as the neutral conductors are not broken but as soon as you get a fault in neutral on the installation, loads of equipment in your installation becomes live and kills people. So that's so why. So the so the protective conductor terminal and the neutral were just commonly connected together in the socket outlets. Yes, and that's TNC. Well, and say it does work as long as all those all working. Yeah, but, but of course, yeah, once I, that I, neutral I, becomes broken somewhere, you can imagine the problem. So all that stuff in your house is live, and there's people getting shocked from it, and RCDs don't work, and it's like the it's the open pen conductor. But it's the open pen conductor in your house, not outside in the street. So, right and now we know why yeah, TNC is not allowed and uh, should never be used. So, yeah, well, I think it's fair to say that. we've seen on social media there are guys out there who are actually finding few spurs where they've had a fault or something's gone wrong and they have combined the neutral. It's you know rather than rewiring the cable, they've actually connected the neutral and earth together. Um, I think I, I I think it's fair to say you can see that um, more often than not. But one of the things we didn't cover uh, was the responsibility for providing a means of earthing. And I think it's probably worthwhile, again, covering the electrical safety quality continuity regs of 2002, um, because there is a requirement for the uh, the installation to be satisfactorily earthed. Regulation 26, paragraphs 1 and 2, require the consumer's installation to be constructed, installed, protected and arranged to prevent so far as practical danger. 
and interference with the distributor's network. Now, this is where it, it, it then says a consumer's installation complying with 7671 is deemed to meet those requirements. What a load of tosh. That does not carry weight. That is a network not understanding LV, mm. and that is the LV guys assuming that everything's fine on the network. There is an evident breakdown between the wine regulations committee and the people in the networks understanding how things operate nowadays. Can now, that, can you read that last bit again, please, about 7671? Yeah. A consumer's installation complying with the requirements of BS 7671 is deemed to meet the statutory requirements. Crazy. It is crazy, and we'll go on to why it's crazy. But for everyone listening, this is the gold nugget here. When an electric, where, sorry, where the electric, electricity distributor does provide an earthing facility. So if you go into a home and there is an existing earthing facility, the responsibility of ensuring the safety and efficiency of this facility rests with the distributor as required by regulation 24 paragraph one of the electrical safety quality continuity regulations. And this is one of the things that more and more electricians now are finding when they go into a house and there is a bonding clamp, for instance, uh, and they ring up the DNO, the DNO say, not my problem, mate, go and get a rod. It says regulation 24 of the safety quality, a distributor or meat or operator shall ensure that each item of his equipment which is on the consumer's pre premises, but is not under the control of the consumer, is suitable for its purpose. Installed and so far as reasonably practicable, maintained to prevent danger. So that's interesting. How do how do meter operators and DNOs maintain equipment in people's houses? Is there a maintenance regime that we all miss where they send letters around going, sorry, we just want to come and check our equipment. It's amazing, isn't it? You can now see so, why UK Power Networks and EDF sold the network off because the cost of this is prohibitive. The, um, the, question, the question is then, if you're an electrician and you've got this issue and the supplier obviously says, oh, no, put a rod in. What I mean, other than practically doing that, what kind of options are there to persecute and actually put a legislation in place over that supply authority? Yeah, um, it would need a case study or a precedent set of someone getting shocked or hurt. Um, and that's the but, problem. But you as the electrician there, there and then would be able to fix that by putting a rod in. Uh, you could, but at the end of the day, it's down to the DNO to maintain to prevent danger. Okay. If you've lost your earth, but the, electrician... the DNO is responsible. Yeah. yeah, but if the electrician gets a basically go fish from that supplier, the yeah. electrician has two options to either leave it as dangerous as it is. Yeah which obviously is not them doing what they can or putting in a rod. So, so they're getting away with it. But if they're putting in a rod, that then leaves you, because just remember something like with anything, we always start the legislation, Dave, as you know, mm -hmm. but we work our way down. So there is a wonderful document that's called the Customer LV Earthing Desi Installation Earthing Design, document number EDS 060017. Now this has been published for UK Power Networks. There will be equivalents for Western and other parts of the country. UK Power Networks covers London, Eastern and Southern areas. Um, it's a rather large DNO. And basically what it says, um, there's lots of references to PME. So let's say you've got PME and you've you've lost your earth. You've gone in, you haven't got an earth. Mm -hmm. So you assume it's down to the DNO and the DNO say, go, go spin. Well, it, it clearly states in 4.1, um, there is a summary of where a PME term, earth terminal was not permitted. OK, it then says, unless specified otherwise, these installations shall use TT. So naturally, someone on the phone will go, well, you can just TT it, which shall consist of an independent earth electrode and RCD. It then says the TT earthing system should be segregated by a minimum of two metres from any PME earthing system. Well, how the hell does the electrician know that? Or know where so that So then there's a, duty, there's a duty of cooperation and coordination. So, yes, they can say go go swing, but at some point they need to come to the table with some level of information. So they then go, go putting in an earth rod that creates a possible issue of diverted neutral currents. So they'll put in an earth rod and pick up too close to the cable, um, you know, some sort of form of leakage or neutral currents because there's a high uh, impedance joint somewhere. And it will then in enter the installation and go through the bonding conductors. Mm hmm. 
which could happen. This is one of the problems with PME as an earthing well, source. It's, it's the same reason why in the update of 722, it actually says under the TN section, right at the end of the TN section, it says you could do TT alternative, but we don't recommend that for the exact same reason. They don't recommend yeah. doing TT conversion so for, for the EV points. So let's let's. I'm gonna I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna jump here. It it may be, or it could be argued, or it could be fair to say that the DNO networks are failing to the point where we know from the last podcast that there are more and more cases of um, broken pen conductors, high impedance joints. Um, if we are getting more cases where we are getting effectively diverted neutral current, because that's basically what it is, it's diverted neutral current, you can see our installations going more and more towards TT. Now, we know from our research on prosumer that the future of the regulations is going to head towards foundation earth electrodes. Yeah, it's going to be basically a very large form of, and if we can't get a foundation earth electrode, it's going to be a TT. The trouble is, is how do you TT if there's not that cooperation and coordination? So in the table, um, and it's on our Instagram page, um, there's extracts from it. But in the table, it says PME Earth table uh, terminal not allowed at exhibition shows and stands, fairgrounds, amusement parks, circuses, mobile transportable vehicles or any outside broadcasting, caravans, motor caravans, boats, marinas, petrol fuel filling stations, permanent buildings associated with the above installations, um, living accommodations, offices, restaurants, and shops. That's mm -hmm. included with the ones above. Um, however, you can, if the building is electrically separated and the installation complies with the bonding requirements of 7671. Uh, all refineries, no. Um, uh, mines and quarries, no. Railway, yes, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I'll come on to why. Farms, agriculture, and horticultural premises, yes. You know, everything else, pretty much uh, EV charging points in the highway, no. But EV charging points in premises, yes. Mm -hmm. So and this is this is where I think, and if we talk about hot tubs, even um, hot tubs, do we export the PME there? Do we do we TT it? These are the questions that people are asking. Um, when we should really also be considering if I export that PME, which we know we can export PME so long as we have <coughs> control measures and protection and bonding and we don't have in the event of a broken pen conductor a metal tap on the wall that could kill someone via yeah. diverted neutral current to the general mass of earth well, just just let me just go on ask a quick question just in case some people listening aren't too sure of what it actually means what does export pme mean oh take it outside of the echo potential zone or the building of which it's so that's a protective conductor that's gone into an echo potential zone or a faraday cage effect and then it's yes. taking that same conductor outside of that area yeah with it having a common reference of neutral or not now that it's been separated? Well, if um, I'm thinking for a shed here, so if I exported it out to a shed, mm. I would um, run my live neutral on earth and in my shed, if there was anything that was exposed or extraneous, I would bond like, uh, an earth accordingly. Like a water tap that you've taken yes. down yes. under the ground and you've risen a tap. So yes. that's a, an extraneous conductive part in yes. a location external to your potential zone. Yes. Now, so. what I would do, what I would do, because maybe I'm a bit of a nerd or a weirdo, I would run, I would connect the primary side of the armoured to the uh, PME supply mm -hmm. to offer protection, earth protection for the armoured cable that I would run. I would then use an insulated gland on the connection to the board and I would TT that shed. That's what I would do. If it was a major building, I wouldn't. If it was a building with offices, I wouldn't do that. I would just run the PME and the submain and everything in that building would be bonded accordingly. Um, but if it was a shed in my house or if it was a uh, um, uh, hot tubs, I can't believe we're talking about hot tubs in England, but if it was a hot tub. It's been a I very would... popular question lately, hasn't it? Well, hot this tubs. is this is my engineering judgment. Yeah. I would I would protect. I would always run an armored cable. Mm hmm. I would ensure that if they, the old shovel went through the armoured cable, that there was an earth return path. But at the load end, I would gap that armoured and I would ensure that um, obviously it was within insulated uh, enclosures. And I would put my own local earth rods to provide a it's, local earth just for that equipment. It's exactly the way I would. Um, it's exactly how I would. And it's exactly the way that we recommend oh, doing uh, caravan park hookups. Right. Because the caravan park hookups, obviously the socket outlet for the caravans cannot be on a PME, 
but a lot of caravan parks will have a warden or a block a toilet block those can be on a pme and we have the option of either putting the tt in at the intake and then going off with a tt to you know probably 50 caravans in a string and that brings a a selectivity question if that rcd was to trip or we take the pme out and then in the little hookups we can then do a tt for finer selectivity arrangement so yeah i see it raised a lot um, and obviously hot tubs has been a very um popular question lately it seems to be going around a lot of uh, different places and so mm. this one of the things that bugs me and it's it's my biggest issue with earthing is where you have one and more start again where you have more than one supply so i'm going to use a railway example because my the majority of my career is railways mm -hmm. um oxford circus station it has eight dno supplies uh -huh. eight with loads of static switches and all sorts so by the time you get to the operations room you would need eight supplies to fail um with lots of changeover switches before they would notice any power had gone other mm -hmm. than obviously face failure relays um that everything in that railway station is common bonded from an earthing perspective but one of the things that um we noticed on railways and dave you know what i'm talking about here is is the use of earth clamps leak earth leakage clamps is a really good functional check before you start working on an earthing system because one of the one of the biggest problems i have with earthing in general is the connection to earth should in theory be inert there should be no electron flow through that conductor we now have a combined neutral earth conductor supplying virtually every building in the country which is now designed to carry energy electron flow whatever and we're now exporting it and reconfiguring it now with any um, electrode if you give it a a juicier or a low impedance path electron flow will go through that so for instance if i have a power supply at a railway station and i have say let's half an amp of leakage from my installation that should in theory go into the dno head and away but if i have a lovely old cast iron gas main or a uh, water lead um, water pipe that may be of a lower impedance than my ze on my electrical installation so over the years electrical installations again this is just my personal and professional opinion over the years domestic electrical installations were protected by more than one electrode Mm. They were protected by a lead water main, a gas main, and an electrical supply. So you always had redundancy in your electrodes. Now, because because of the amount of junk that's dumped down the water and the, the gas, especially the metal gas networks, their pipe works corroding to the point of absurdity, make it non-conductive. Boom, I've lost my resilience. Now more junk's going down the DNOs. We're losing the lead water mains for MDP as well. So that's going. So in the minute you start exporting earthing, you create a major, major problem that never really existed before. And, and you go back in time 20 years ago, if it was TNS, you never had to worry about any of this. Mm. You never had to. Now, I, we genuinely are, we have the problem of now enhanced leakage currents from within the installations and also the risk of diverted neutral currents. And Dave, you know what I'm talking about because there is installations where you will have, let's again, I'll use railways where you'll have one or two supplies or one or two different railway operators. And if the impedance of, let's say, my station's um, water main, which is lead, is very low, then what I'll find is I'll get diverted neutral currents from another railway station, which is interconnected. So I now have an inert system, which is charged and carrying energy the qu the query with, with this is obviously if you look at the definitions of what live is or charged mm -hmm. under electricity work regulations it mainly yep. focuses on stored energy or values of voltage um so it's very hard to quantify what value yeah. of charge would be dangerous because <clears throat> you could be measuring one two three or 10 20 30 amps between two yep. metal parts and you can easily go into your environment and you can go oh that's just an earth connection and you can work on it with a lot less risk assessment you could just say oh I'll just take that off and tighten it i think it's just a protective conductor when in theory when you actually disconnect and get in between that connection you could you know there's there's a potential value there so of, de of death most electricians and i'll admit to this when i was younger and i was learning and i was a bit of a scallywag if i worked in a board and i was adding an extra circuit when i would connect that cpc in or disconnect that cpc for that i would sometimes see on the earth bar a little sparking 
Mm. You know, a little bit of sparking, and that could be from the connected load. You know, it could be residual current just discharging into that earth. But nowadays, I mean, uh, we it's fair to say that I have measured myself n nearly 50 amps of energy on an earthing conductor. This is in recent times. And I've also measured, um, I know Paul Skern will say, oh, no, no, you can't have. But there is DC leakage that you get from DC railways. We know that because there is equipment that can do that measurement. Um, and that's to me, that's diverted neutral currents. Now, even from railway traction systems, the return, which is what they call it, is in our world, a neutral current. Mm. And, and where you have poorly earthed or per, poorly configured installations, um, you're going to get diverted neutral currents. And these standards that they've written, um, where there's, they actually talk about railways in this one, section 5.1, and they basically say there's this huge departure for railways. Um, and as long as there is, I mean, it actually says a PME sh um, shall not be provided to sites that have AC and DC. That's fine. There is no track transfer. The DC system is not and will not be connected to Earth, which they always are in some form apart from London Underground. The DC supply is segregated by at least one meter from the PMA uh, through soil. So there's obviously lots of signs behind this. And simultaneous contact between LV Earths um, cannot occur. But all Earths are common. Everything's common bonded, even mm -hmm. even via a fortuitous well, means, i.e. incidental. Everything you can't. Well, it's for, is that true Earth? Yes. If things are going to true Earth, you can't. I mean, unless, unless you're going to put a huge amount of distance between them. Realistically, it's hard to engineer out. I, I when I was doing my 2391, there was a chap from London Electricity Board and he he basically said London is saturated with energy. There is no such thing as zero volts in London. All there is is equipotential zones, making sure the buildings that sit on it have equal voltages on exposed and extraneous metalworks. That's all you can achieve. Mm. You are just discharging down to a very saturated ground. And he is, I, 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 I never, ever forgot that because it's so true. The, the, the thing is, because we've got equipotential zones, we're not really discovering or seeing this problem that much. You know, until one yeah. gets broken, like you know, like we've seen recently, so, where where a simple connection breaks, and then suddenly you have sparks occurring in furniture, in you know, in street furniture. So I think it's fair to say, um, and this is my piece of advice, <clears throat> and anyone from the IET or any engineer who wants to disagree with me, I respectfully would happily have that debate with you. Um, I happily show you evidence. Um, but what I want to do is move on to the the rumor mill. Um, we should call this the the, the newsflash. So um, foundation, because oh. we realized that we spoke in the last one. We didn't even cover foundation earthing. So what I want to do is I want to share my screen with you now. And I am going to because John Moore taught me so well in the last one. So hopefully you should be able to see. I don't know if you can. Um, mm -hmm. Can you see my? Yeah. So this is um, this is an actual foundation earth electrode. It's for Crossrail. Um, this is at Westbourne Park. So what they did was they put. Um, 24 meter deep piles 1.8 meters wide and what we basically did was we connected we had two points of connection we had one on the pile cap and one on the pile and as you can see it's it's an unbroken connection and that's what we did we ran two two connections out this is just a photo of um, one of them and we just used these um, standard clamps on the um, on the rebar which is a reinforcing agent um, on the uh, mm -hmm. On the pile so they're all linked together by like a deck of rebar so that they don't move and that now is the retaining wall if you get on a crossrail train and go out of west london in the next year um that wall is earthed for the local substation and that's foundation earthing it's so just... that one that one lower in the image is that a dedicated spike electrode for the purpose or is that just jumping on a that's just jumping driven... on, yeah that's a, a vertically a driven piece of rebar yeah yeah all right and what i can show you is so there's a, a another Oh, hang on. There you go. There's another uh, picture of it. I'm just going to try and zoom in if I can. Uh, so you can see, you can see it came in through the duct, clamped, clamped on the horizontal, clamped on the vertical. Mm -hmm. So we made sure we had good connections. Um, and that was my feet taking photos. And then we put a little label that said main earthing for the HV transformer. So this was for the HV uh, center tap. This was the local earth, which was literally directly next to it um that was it then wrapped in denso tape so if you are doing um um 
earthing connections that are outside denso tape is fantastic for protection against corrosion and remember when we're selecting and erecting the installation we must be thinking about protection from corrosion now simple rule of thumb that i have with all my sparks is they must have a tub of vaseline with them at all times um, because on railways where you have any connection that's exposed to external influences even um, battery terminals on ups's or on signaling sets the connection is caked in vaseline just to protect it from the air and corrosion mm -hmm. and oxidization here because it's buried <clears throat> we just use some denso tape um, and then that's obviously um, left until it's next inspected in a precast chamber obviously to ensure it was uh, protected let's see if i can show you another one um best fit yeah that was just a label again and that's it in context there so that was all eventually tarmacked and then there was a nice nice big chamber where uh, people could access and then get access to the connection on the pole cap and that's a that's a permanent feature so yeah that's um that's foundation earthing now within a domestic world let me stop sharing the screen now with a domestic world it would be quite different because a lot of houses now it'd be fair can you is the screen back to normal i can't really tell yep. okay within a domestic world i think there's some form of proposal on new builds that there's some form of foundations there i don't know what modern builds have as far as foundations because years ago you dig a trench you pour it a concrete you get your flat base and you build a brick wall and you just brick you know pillars or whatever i don't know if they do piles or mini piles or cage piles um I'm not but, too. Sh I'm not too sure myself. I remember when we did our podcast with um, Sean from Dane. He said that in Europe, where they have basements in a lot of buildings, yes. they utilise foundation earth electrodes a lot. They use obviously, you know, metalwork in the structure. Obviously, on in, you know, in this country, this is just like, it is not maybe a common trend. Um, and that you know, but it, it's we we we've 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 discussed this in our in our previous discussion about the. The direction 60364 is taking and you know the way presume is coming in and foundation earth electrodes um so yeah um what do you think that's going to look like uh in in the domestic a foundation earth electrode i mean do you think that that it's likely to come in soon well i think it will but it's going to have to go in as as a new build thing. It's not something you can just sort of retrofit into your house because no. obviously you, you can't do it. But <laughs> right the with a load of rebar. That, yeah, but the thing is, if you're building a house, you're going to be putting foundation things in anyway. So the actual added cost of putting a foundation electrode in is is pretty minimal, really, because you're going to be having that reinforcement stuff in there. the mm -hmm. The main thing is to leave a bit of it accessible so that then the electrical the, tractor can then connect to it at a later time that's the key so, really the bit that's not quite conclusive is uh if 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 you know if if we all have to get involved in that point to tell them where to leave an accessible point or if they will be told where to leave it accessible and how accessible will it be there's going to be a period of to and fro where we'll have a lot of um potential frustration i doubt very much they'll be leaving a pit the size of the one paul's just showed us uh, no in all fairness i designed said yeah. it and i said i'm a human being i want to be able to get down on the floor and actually access it rather than one of them really crappy earth electrode pots that you buy from the wholesalers and get minimal access i wanted to be able to get both hands in and on and put some probes on rather than the usual rubbish so yeah one of the joys of doing engineering is if you want to you can think outside the box and work from the minimum um, and sometimes, obviously, this is this is more this was more industrial. And I think commercial industrial, if we can say, foundation electrodes or foundation earthing is coming in one way or another in the next amendment or the amendment after. That's a given. I think commercial industrial will have no problem in doing it because no. realistically, what is it? It's basically a mass. It's your substructure acting as your your TT, your earth rod. Um, pretty resilient, pretty robust. Hopefully you're not exporting DC so it doesn't corrode the rebar because we know that happens. Um, in the domestic world, do you know what my opinion is? I genuinely think when the new buildings are built, there'll be a series of rods between three to nine rods stuck in somewhere under the ground and all common bonded with just a bit of green and yellow sticking up or something directly underneath where the mains intake is. Um, I've seen that before. I mean, I have seen... Uh, 
years ago in Romford, the BT lines, they used to have um, earth reference cables. And so what they would do is at the end of the line, they would stick a rod in just near to where the supply cable went and then just put a tiny little bit of um, like, I don't know, four mil stranded bare wire and connect that in sometimes or wrap it directly around the DNO head and link the two together. Mm-hmm. And that was an earthing thing for the um, a legacy from BT. But um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of kickback because in the 18th edition amendment, was it? No, it's a draft of public comment. Draft. They mentioned, didn't they, um, foundation, well, not foundation earth odes, like local earth electrodes. And of course, it all kicked off because everyone was going, I'm in the third floor of a masonette in Muswell Hill. Where the hell do I put a local earth rod in? It's just going to stick through Mrs. Jones's kitchen roof. Um, yeah, that would have been a disaster if that had come in because you would have had people in like that situation in place you can't put one. And then the other problem is one like on a normal house or whatever on the ground floor, you would have had people just going and banging in electrodes randomly all over the place and spiking through the gas main and all kinds of other stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was probably a good thing that that did not make it into the final version. But um, it's inevitable that some kind of uh, thing, thing yeah. is going to come in. I mean, te- technology has obviously kind of pushed this aside because obviously one of the other issues was, was uh, electrodes with, with EV. Uh, and technology's coming in, open technology, but that won't get rid of the problem of what we subsequently want to have is the ability for everyone's property to become an island. You know, so should the integrity of the of the network actually not be there or should it just turn off one day? Everybody should be able to generate and protect themselves with their own little reference of that. Dave, I can see in 20 years' time a communal tower block having a communal earthing system, and they will be their own island, and and, and it will be... Um, the regulations have changed. We've got to rewire... When they rewire the submains, they'll have to put in some local earth electrode, which every tenant will be responsible for contributing as part of the rates or something like that. Yeah. I, can, I can see that happening, and then a little path somewhere, they'll find a place to put four or five rods in, um, and that will just get discreetly connected in um, using a bit of 35 or whatever. But, yeah, I think I, I can see that happening. But this is not immediate. This is slowly, slowly catchy monkey. Um, we've got to still get people to understand surge protection. And then the manufacturers want everyone to understand arc fault detection. And by the time they've done that, um, we'll be <laughs> prosuming. Uh, and by the time we've done that, the networks will be shot to pieces. And, and ho- hopefully by then... Earthen- you are. Hopefully, hopefully by then everyone might understand bonding as well. We haven't even got <laughs> onto that yet, really, have we? Um, but we have now covered foundation electrodes, which is good. Um, I, me personally, I, I am very tempted now to um, use... Um, I'm very tempted to actually get a TT supply put into my house and just go with a series of rods and maintain mm-hmm. my own earth because I think it would just be far less of a to ball be fair, yeah to be fair we've got so many installs these days with these new um you know a lot of people are bringing in battery charges you've got the tesla banks and stuff it, now is the time for people to start looking at creating the beginning of this of these islands you know a little domestic world little electrodes i'm going through 743 right now and it, you know looking at the measurements it says we should have and the positioning of the foundation electrodes it's all doable i understand it completely the other big benefit of TT is electromagnetic compatibility because TNCS is hideous mm. for that because of all those circulating currents going all over the place. Yeah. So if, if that is something that's important to your installation, which it is in a lot of cases, then uh, get rid of TNCS and uh, go TT and you've fixed another load of problems. And, and this is why I can't stand, I genuinely can't stand TNCS. I mean, you imagine it. We have been taught, and maybe I'm showing my age here, that a line conductor and a neutral conductor, that's your, that will run your circuit. Your CPC is there to protect in case of fault, to protect life in case of fault. And you're thinking, well, that's marvellous. That's great. Yeah. But on a TNCS, you basically go 10 metres away and it links to the neutral. And you're just thinking to yourself, this, this, is, this, is, this is a crock. This is, mm. this is wrong. All it, all it really did is it kind of fixed the problem. Because obviously, when did you say TNCS came through? 78, I believe it was mentioned. Yeah. I believe in the document it mentions from 1978. That's just, I mean, that can't be far from when we started to be a lot more aware of impedance measurements and the impact of impedance measurements. Yeah, it's all instrumentation. Yeah, it's the 15th edition, basically. Yeah, because TNCS, what that did is it fixed a lot of problems we have with ADS, because obviously with higher impedances, the TNCS assisted with that. 
Um, and we still focus heavily on that being a, a benefit, that TNCS is a benefit because we have the more rapid impedances. Um, but we used to have, in the good old days, we used to have EBADOS, didn't we? EBADOS, uh, yeah. potential bonding and automatic disconnection supply. Yeah. Now it's ADS. Yeah. Do you remember cage bonding? Uh, no. That? In no. the domestic, we used to put a dedicated 4 mil conductor from the bath uh, from the oh, board to yes. the bathroom. Yes, yes. We created a cage within the but within the home. That's right. And everybody, every time uh, you did any auto race additions, you had to cross bond every single tap and into the CPC of the light switch. And it was like, hmm? I've got to run some mini trunking now up the wall. And people were mortified that you were bonding their go, radiators. Go, and... Local authorities would go in there and they'd have a little sticky trunking where they would be going yeah, out of the light I've switch installed up that. to the heater, from the heater, across to the shower, down to the pipes. Everything was cross cross connected. I installed it and I just found it absolutely ridiculous to be perfectly frank. Um, I but never, that's the I've confusion that we it. still see today. We still see people wondering about whether putting pigtails in connections as well, you know, in these little earth connections and all, all that stuff. The way it's re innovated or rewritten the rules of bonding um, has created confusion over time. Well, yeah. I think on that bombshell, and if we haven't got anything more to talk about earthing, we should probably stop there. Because I think we'll probably need yeah. to do another one. I'm um, looking at I'm looking at uh, seven four three, and I think we should have a dedicated chat on that at a later date. Fine, we'll do that. We'll do that at a later date. Right, okay. Um, that's it, really. I think we've done our thing now. Uh, well, we probably haven't, but I think that's enough. Covered enough we've covered. Now. We've covered enough for now, and we'll let you know more than when we know more. But um, I think the the thing is is the uh, proceed with caution when you're selecting and erecting. If you don't have a clamp meter, I would suggest you go and get a decent earth leakage clamp meter um, and and investigate for yourself. A lot of people in our little communities are now just clamping and looking. Yeah. You know, because obviously you can't see it, but you put a clamp meter around, now you can. Yep. And, and you know, there's current when they didn't expect there to be current. Yep. Yeah, as well as I said in the last episode, that if, if you haven't got one, just get one, even a cheap one, any one, and then just stick it on some of the... Uh, earthing and the bonding conductors in an installation and see what you get and it's quite revealing mm. if you actually find and if you've got a really really cheap one that's really bad um send it to john and he'll blow it up <laughs> and set fire to it in his unique way um right chaps thank you very much as always um we hope this has been useful um we will cover i think we'll do one on bonding and we'll do 7430 and other bits and bobs and um until the next one um chaps thank you very much Cheers, bye-bye. Take care of yourself and yep. each other. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.